my name is Ros Bell and I'm the AV and New Technologies Coordinator at the Yarn Guild at Learning Commons. So that's AV and New Technologies, not AV and New Technologies, which some people sometimes get confused with. So I'm here to talk to you about DigiLab. Um, so, uh, DigiLab is like a series of events, that is workshops and discussion groups around new technology. So the aim is to uh, open up technology to students and to anyone really who's interested in it but mainly for students who wouldn't normally have access to this kind of technology. Uh, so the events that we run are drop-in, um, they run throughout the entire day in the Learning Commons, and we, um, and we, uh, yeah, we invite speakers, we invite uh, academics, we have our own collection that we demonstrate, and the workshops we, um, we run are to kind of give students a, a bit more of a practical, hands-on demonstration with that, where they can learn how to program, um, how to build robots. You'll see more about that in the rest of the, of the uh, presentation. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we, um, the, the main purpose of DigiLab, one of my, book, my major bugbears is people will often say to me, oh, I'm not a very techy person, don't really get tech. Don't know if anyone here is guilty of saying that, but I'm sure <laughs> plenty of you are. Um, so it's my, my, uh, my aim to eradicate this phrase from the, <laughs> the English language. Um, so, <clears throat> A good thing about DigiLab is that it brings together lots of different types of people. So it's a safe space for people who aren't familiar with tech or don't feel like they're very techy to come and just have a go at stuff, <laughs> learn about things. But it's also a really great place for people who, who do have tech knowledge to come and share that knowledge with other people with complementary skills. Um, recently we had a student who was having issues with a virtual reality model that she'd built and another student who we had uh, invited to come along had, uh, was able to share his knowledge with her and um, built something then and there in that, the actual DigiLab session which she was able to demo to students. So that's kind of the connection that we hope to make. Cool. Um, so yeah, we invite students, academics, uh, companies, startups, Kickstarters uh, along to our events. Thanks. And you can also see here, this is one of our student team who's dem demonstrating our own equipment. So we've got a collection uh, at DigiLab, the library. We've got 3D printers, virtual reality headsets. Uh, we also have um, ro various robotics kits, lots of different stuff around there. So we're constantly searching for uh, new and interesting stuff that we can buy to add to our own collections. And this is one of our student team who's demonstrating an old Oculus Rift now. This is, uh, technology moves very fast, obviously. So this is a defunct old um, Oculus Rift headset. But one of the ways that we, um, we are able to run DigiLab is via the help of our student team who uh, basically make it, make it run. They help promote the events, they help try and get students in who don't know what's going on and just kind of bring them into the DigiLab world. And they also demonstrate the tech as well. Thanks. Okay, so workshops are a more in-depth look at technology. So where the events are drop in, have a go, Workshops will actually teach you tools. So we have programming workshops for, for beginners, which we ran yesterday. Well, we, ran one, we ran one yesterday, very successfully. Um, and 3D, like 3D printing, introductions, that kind of thing. So really, beginners and intermediary kind of levels of learning actual skills with technology. Thanks. So this is a picture of someone who was making their own uh, handheld gaming kit. Uh, this, is pretty, this is pretty cool. We partnered with Mad Lab in the city centre and they um, guided us through how to build your own handheld gaming device. Thanks. And uh, this is also a photograph of Mad Lab in, its, in itself and this is a group of students learning, I think, how to, make a, how to make your own portable speaker. So it's really giving students an introduction to soldering, electronics, that kind of thing that people wouldn't normally have access to if, say, you're in SALC or what have you, and you're not, you don't necessarily use electronics on a day-to-day -day basis. So, who do we work with? Um, we invite, like I say, we invite lots of external people to come along and demonstrate their stuff. Uh, a great number of um, companies are desperate to speak to students, so we just offer them a facility to do that. Um, thanks. We, this is a picture of a local artist, he's a digital kind of technologist, artist, maker, and he is demonstrating something which is called the Awkward Arcade. And that is, uh, that is now being commissioned, he, well he was commissioned to make it and it's now being, um, being shown up and down the country. 
So he's the kind of person that we, we would ask to come to showcase some of your some of his ideas before like prototypes before they get developed into full blown ideas. Thanks. We also invite people from Kickstarter. So this is an amazing company, and I desperately want everyone to buy this game because it's wonderful. It's called <laughs> it's called uh, Beasts of Balance, and it was successfully kickstarted and will be shipping in November, and it's wonderful. And they came and uh, demonstrated this game and were overjoyed to, to, uh, to get all of the student feedback. A lot of students um, took it more seriously than they were expecting, trying to stack the game. So the idea is that it's a, a physical and digital game at the same time. You should look, up, look it up because it's really great. It's called Beasts of Balance. So, yeah. And also we invite students. So. PhD researchers, anyone who's got any kind of technological project that they might want to either show to people or get feedback on or just need warm bodies and they're fed up of asking their mates to do the same research over and over again, they can come and ask a bunch of people they don't know. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's, that's been pretty successful with a lot of PhD and their uh, undergrad students. So why do we do any of this? Uh, it's a good question. Well, um, a lot of the time I get asked, you know, does this really belong in a library? And I would say, like, vehemently, yes, it does. Uh, yeah. um, the libraries are changing, and they're not just a place to access the written word now, and haven't been for a long time. They're a place to access all information, and that includes technology. And it's important to learn about the technology that you're learning with as well. Um, and also, university students are missing out a lot. Primary school age kids now are learning how to code. There, there was an initiative recently about the BBC Microbit. I don't know if anyone's got kids who knows about that. Um, children are being given one of these to learn how to hardware program at a very basic kind of level. Uh, there's a whole curriculum overhaul of, of computing. And this is something to, that's been designed to fill in a skills gap, but won't come into effect until, you know, for a good 10, 15 years. So I'm trying to battle that by getting students involved in technology who wouldn't normally have that opportunity. So yeah, that's, that's DigiLab. Any questions? Any questions now? Does anyone have a burning question? Should we, should we start with that? Anyone want to um, question or ask us about what Ros has said? So maybe, do, do you know whether, um, how, say, students then maybe use the technology in their live dissertations or their research projects? Or, um, yeah, so we, I'm hoping that that does happen, uh, but we've, we've really only been going for a couple of years, so that's that's not that hasn't happened yet, I don't think. But um, what I'm what I'm looking to do is is trying to get students, like I say, who wouldn't normally have access to that kind of technology or learning how to program, say, to write a program that then they might be able to use in further research. But yeah, the the main uh, people that we've affected with that actual specific academic stuff is PhD students who've used. Did you love for research? There's been a number of them that have done that. I have a question. Is it open for staff as well? Oh yeah, like the, the uh, events and, and in fact actually the workshops are open to staff. We just, because DigiLab is so flexible and I'm so on board with getting on with anything that is related to technology, I find that if I start talking about all of the possibilities of DigiLab, uh, people start to sort of glaze <coughs> over. <laughs> so, um, I've minimised it to, to students at the moment, but yeah, staff are more than welcome to come. Um, our next, I should say, our next DigiLab event is on the 3rd of November. They happen on the first Thursday of every month, um, and it will be November, December, and then February, March to kind of work around the term times and also exam times. So everyone is more than welcome to come. You don't have to be a student, just come and try stuff out and, uh, and learn about things. Brilliant, thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be more questions later. Thanks, thanks. Okay, um, so I was asked to talk about uh, using um, technology with an established event. Um, so I've, what I wanted to do today was talk to you about smartphones and app and lots of running around. So it's slightly different to Ros's presentation in that it's more of a project presentation rather than a sort of service. But I thought the best way to describe it would be first to tell you about the event itself before we start <coughs> using the app, and then show you how we use the feedback from the first event to then develop the app. So the thing that got it started was last year, um, I was really struck by a public attitudes to science um, report that was published by Ipsos Morricone. 
which showed that 35% of people still think that scientists are just their findings to get the answers they want. So I should have said at the beginning that I'm a research scientist, okay, and I'm not a tech person, and I say that a lot, so I'm going to say that now. Um, but what the Murray Poll also said was that 29% of people think that scientific research is never checked by other scientists. Now, if you're a research scientist, you'll know that peer review is our bread and butter, and that we go through traumas with data interpretation, and it's clear that the general public are completely unaware of this. So I thought, how could we help people start a discussion about data interpretation? Now, it just so happened at the time that um, I met with a lady called Jetta, um, Greta, Greta Santagata, I have to get her name right. So she's an alumni from the University of Manchester and has her own film company called Oropendola Productions, and she got in touch with me because she wanted to make more science communication films. So we had a chat about this report, and then she came back a couple of months later with a street game. Now, I'd never even heard of a street game, um, but she came back with a lady called Jana Wendler from Playfew, who designed, she's in the Faculty of Humanities, and she designed street games as a hobby, and she's very, very good at it. So, between us, we came up with a scenario for an outbreak. So this was the time that um, Ebola was obviously in the news an awful lot, and I don't know if you know, but in the first two weeks of the Ebola outbreak, 99 Ebola genomes were sequenced because of a huge advance in technology. And this had a huge impact on the vaccine design and the progression to clinical trials, which happened about 12 months later. So we came up with this scenario, which we uh, made a short film at the beginning uh, to, to show to the players. And then, sorry, there's a lot of animation, but it's scary. Okay, so then the next thing is the players were, had to identify a virus using UV torches outside and glow gel, so they had to identify a shape. And then they had to blast the virus sequence to find out the species source. Now, you don't need to know what this is, but it basically involves genetics, and all of the players managed this no problem at all. Then um, we, they had to design a vaccine and decide on, decide on chemotherapy based on the information that was presented. So we gave them some film, we gave them some written stuff and a bit of role play. So they went to a mock-up lab where there was a Royal Society fellow there who was actually an actor who talked to them about vaccines and chemotherapy. And then they had to return to the information hub and present their findings in a live filmed press release that was actually uh, chaired by Sam Illingworth from uh, MMU, and it was absolutely fantastic. And then they were given the consequences of the decisions they'd made, um, which was anything between killing 10,000 to 10 million people, depending on the decisions they'd made with the vaccine. But all through this, they had government advisors calling them on their mobile phones every 15 minutes <laughs> to ask them for progress. So there was a lot of adrenaline, and there was a lot of pace with the game. So this is the advert that we put out on the university network for volunteers, because obviously this was quite a volunteer-heavy game. And these are some of the pictures. So this is players in, um, in St. Peter's Square looking for the UV light. And then the next one, you can see this is the UV torch here. This Sorry, is them, no, it's yeah. fine. This is them doing the genetic sequencing, looking at that. And then the next one is every so often around in the game, they were ambushed by role players. And this is a concerned <laughs> citizen who wants to know how the outbreak is going and how all their research and their science is going. Um, so we ended up with 24 volunteers, which is the most volunteers I've had for any event. And it was absolutely fantastic. And 76 players on one day who rated it 8.5 out of 10. And this is only half the volunteers because the others were out on site. So it was a really, really great event. I really enjoyed it. Okay. One. This is the wordle for the feedback that we had for the event. So you can see that the, all of them really enjoyed it. Awesome was a really great word to use. Intense as well though. Stressful. Stressful, yeah, very <laughs> stressful. And fast paced because of the mobile phone conversations. And then, but the great thing about it was that 55% of the people who came had never been to Manchester Science Festival before. 78% had never played a street game, and I thought we were going to get loads of gamers. So we were engaging with a, an with a audience that we didn't know we'd go to engage with. And 78% weren't scientists. So we were reaching people who didn't know about vaccines and who hadn't been to the science festival before. So that was really good. The feedback generally was that they loved wearing the lab coats, they liked the pressure and the pace of working as a group. What the negative feedback was, they wanted more, more science, more, a longer game, more puzzles, Cake. <laughs> <laughs> Two people said they wanted cake. So what we wanted to do was to take the game to other science festivals. That's what we put in the bid. So 
on the very first page of this um, presentation, I showed you all the sponsors we've had. And this part was sponsored by the ISSF internally. And we'd said in our output that we would take it to other science festivals. But <coughs> we, we bid for Cheltenham Science Festival. But you can imagine with 24 volunteers, five players, um, a film crew, and Sam Illingworth, which we really wanted to have again, <laughs> it was an expensive undertaking. And we didn't get the money that we wanted to do this. So we had to strip down the game at the last minute, about six weeks beforehand. But we were already in the brochure for Cheltenham Science Festival. So I had slight panic, um, and this is where the technology comes in. So because we had to strip it down, I wondered if we could run the game as an app on a smartphone. And there's been a lot of talk about using apps for public engagement. And I found, after doing some research, I found this app, Action Bound, which is brilliant. Now it's essentially a scavenger hunt app, but the great thing about it is that it's free for players to download, and the license cost is very low, particularly if you're not charging, and the um, and it's an educational output. So it can take film um, information, uh, flyers in it, it can take GPS locators, You can um, the players can acquire points, and you get electronic feedback. Now, if any of you have ever done any events and you've done the feedback on paper, you know what a nightmare it is to put all the numbers in, all the comments and everything. This all comes back as a spreadsheet, as soon as the players have finished the game, and it's extremely easy to set up. So the other thing to mention is that it's based on QR codes. So the app comes with a QR scanner. They don't have to have a QR scanner on the phone, so it's very easy to set up. So we took the positive aspect from the Outbreak game and then translated it to the app. So we had character engagement. So believe it or not, this is a Creative Commons picture. So it's free to use. So this lady was tapping with Mary in the app, and we generated a scenario around her. And then we also made a small video with Dr. V. Iris, who was at the Institute of Infectious Disease. And he gave them the mission to look for the vaccine and the chemotherapy. And then we included pace in it. So obviously, we didn't have everybody ringing up on mobile phones. So we had an alert come up at certain stations in the app, which prompted them to hurry up, because we needed to get the adrenaline. And that was part of the point of the game. So we reminded them they only had an hour to complete the game and that they could skip steps if they wanted to because that's one of the functionalities of the app. Um, and nobody finished beyond an hour, so it worked, this part of it. We had a plot line, and this was based around an NHS normal uh, scenario if there is an outbreak. So they go through green, amber, red, and black alert. So they got this information and it had um, real life uh, outcomes for an amber alert, for instance, initiating contact tracing, which is finding out who infected people have been in touch with. And then a red alert, which means that um, the final thing is to set up a vo voluntary quarantine red zone around the city. So these are very serious things within the NHS, obviously. And we had a, an announcement from the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, so that was in there as well. <laughs> And we still let them have the lab coats, so we took 70 lab coats to Cheltenham, and then we made it remote by basically, uh, the easiest way to think about it is that the QR codes are the treasure. So you put the QR codes around the town, and they pick them up on the way, and each QR code might mean more beds, or um, you know you found another title with Mary or whatever. Okay, so we had 96 players, which was more than at um, in the Manchester Science Festival. They gave it 7.5 out of 10, which was lower than Outbreak, for reasons I'll outline now. But it didn't rain, because <laughs> the whole thing was outside. But the other great thing about the app is that they take a selfie right at the beginning. So you don't need a photographer, which is brilliant, in order to have your output. So you can see that people, when people take selfies, they make much better faces than if there's a photographer involved. So you've got all this as output for the app as well. And it was run by me and my PhD student. There was just the two of us because uh, we'd lost the rest of the team because we didn't have the money. It was really difficult with two people. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> but it, you can do it on a very short staff, basically. Um, so the feedback was that they, it was a good experience, great adventure. They liked the lab coat, still liked the storyline. But the, what didn't go so well was that the queue, because we made it competitive, so it was all about getting points, the QR codes were taken down at various times. <laughs> so the negative is really that they couldn't find the treasure because people had hidden it. So I had spares, but I had to keep going out into the town. Okay, the timers were very tight and they couldn't find some of the GPS locators. 
Okay. So this is another Wordle from that day. So you can see that there are some things like inaccurate that's come out. And so I haven't edited this and illogical. And that's really because they couldn't find the QR codes. But what we wanted to know then was, was this really portable? Could we take it somewhere else? So just after that, a contact um, that I made at Cheltenham, a teacher, wanted to take it to her school as the final event for her middle school for her 12-year-old um, students. So we ran the event, I ran the event one more time and it was teacher-led. So essentially when you think about a treasure hunt, it's all about location. So we had the app and just changed the location to fit with the schoolyard and the playing field. And we had two classes of 25 who were all 12 years old. They had, we split them into two. They had a one hour infection talk from me, which was essentially games with glow gel and a UV torch. A 30 minute game play. They all had iPads because they had the iPads in the school. And then we had a one hour question and answer session with me all together with all 50 kids. And they got to do their selfies as well, so you can see. <laughs> it was just brilliant, they had a great time. So they had University of Manchester lab coats on. They all had names, so this was called Lemon Scented. Why the boys wanted to be Lemon Scented, I don't know. And this is the Crazy Horses. Um, and then when we had the question and answer session, I showed them, not on slides, but just on paper, um, um, EM images of viruses. So we got to talk about Ebola and other viruses and influenza and things that are important in the research in Manchester, but also very scientific as well. <coughs> so just to summarise then, to look at this app development, we went from Manchester Science Festival for a street game, to Cheltenham where we used the app, to the middle school uh, where we used the same app but just changed the locations. So we started off with 24 volunteers, a film crew, 76 players, and a very high rating, which is great, but it's essentially a travelling circus to take it around, and it costs a lot of money. Cheltenham Science Festival, there was just me and my PhD student, two role players, but we got 96 players through, and we got a lower rating because we really needed to tweak the app, and it was really done in a bit of a hurry. And then we went from that to a teacher-led event with 50 children, and we had really good research engagement. And I think that we really managed to inspire the kids. We had a really, well, I did, it was only me. Um, we really uh, managed to inspire the kids, and you know, we had a really good day with them. Okay? And the great thing about it is, obviously, massively reduced cost from the beginning. Um, so just to summarize then, this is the last slide. The advantages are, of using the app, less manpower obviously, it's very engaging, people love using their phones and it's still a novel way to do engagement. We could include a range of media, very rapid feedback, that's my favourite bit of the app, um, <laughs> easily adapted to different environments and locations and the selfies, I love the selfies. But the disadvantages are that you have to rely on the user hardware, so at Cheltenham we had one person who couldn't download the app. Um, they had a, a certain type of phone. I don't know what type of phone it was. The screen output is completely dependent on the type of phone you've got. So if you're doing a video, you have to remember that actually they can see the video only in this much. And if you're in a very noisy place, the audio doesn't work that well. Um, so it would have to start off inside. Um, and then it's less manpower, but for that reason, you've then got less physical engagement. And that was one of the favorite bits about the Outbreak game. And there's obviously fewer surprises, because if you haven't got more a bigger team, then you don't have the ambush aspect. Okay, and that's it. So um, you did ask me to talk, to talk about tips for dissemination, but I don't think I've got time. Yeah, go that's all right. Yeah, go um, go this is the only slide on dissemination. So my, um, my view of dissemination is that it really starts before the event. Because I think that the best way to disseminate events is to get the people who participate to tell other people. Um, so from an academic point of view, obviously, we try and disseminate to our colleagues and then through the press office and other things like that. But if you want to rerun your event, the best thing is if players go out and advertise themselves. So um, I think the best thing is to engage people right from the start. And at Cheltenham, we did this with flyers. Um, with a, you know, a, quite a good spiel to get people interested. And at Cheltenham we had a lot of people who couldn't participate in the game because we just didn't have time. So if we'd run it for two days, we would have easily got you know, 200 players um, to take part. Um, and I think as well, 
being very prompt with feedback to the players, writing blogs after the event and sending reports to funders also really helps with dissemination, setting up a good relationship with your funders so that then they will promote you as well. And can you develop the event and actually take it further like we've done here, which is all really dissemination. It's just not about telling people how successful it was, but actually about developing it and taking it forward. Yeah. That is it. Thank, Thank you very much.